senator, and he published his first Sky News Today. So I want to have a big round of applause. Hard copies up here for those who want it, like the tactile magazine like feel of things. And this is the issue that we get that uh, look back for that other anniversary that no one talked about most of the year for our uh, BCO construction starting in 2008. So that's that. We also had our interview with Sherry, the Better Door Rascal series. I only have about 277 potential more interviews to do before I stop <laughs> that interview, so stay tuned. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think that uh, Bruce did a wonderful job with his first issue, and I'm really excited to look forward to more. Uh, so please check it out. Uh, it's got a lot more, a uh, little bit less astrophysics than I had when I was an editor, and a lot more human interest stories than that. And he's doing, doing a fabulous job. Um, Deb is the treasurer, and Deb is sick tonight. Do you have any figures that you could share? Well, we're basically I'm leaving on a lot. After uh, going from like below five thousand, I think when I started the job six years ago, to I think we're somewhere around the neighborhood of thirteen thousand. Last I checked, uh, paperwork is going through. It's always a transition. When I took over the job, I don't think I got anything more than a. I was basically just a checkbook. I had no paperwork or anything else until mm -hmm. February after the meeting. So I expect that to be a little smoother this time. I'll be having a little bit more of the paperwork in the transition phase, but that'll be done. I can't see that not getting done by January. We're currently uh, working with the CRA to change our year end. I haven't yet heard back from them. Should hear back from them by end of this week, next week, regarding whether our, our new year end will be uh, in, Jack, in December, like regular people. And when that happens, National will be happier because their year end is in in December, and they're always bugging me to give them like special, you know, budgets for the year, and I'm like, no, <laughs> that sounds like extra work I don't need. So that they'll, they'll be much pleased when that happens. So that's what where we're at as far as that goes. Yeah. And and Deb mentioned that her uh, goal as being treasurer was not to end up in a medium security person. <laughs> so, so, so we'll try and work to make that. You have to you have to choose your moments of perjury carefully. So, um, uh, membership. Chris uh, surrendered the the role of president, and he kindly agreed to be a uh, membership person. Have you got updated figures? Sure. Um, so we. Uh, First of all, uh, we do have complimentary copies of the uh, latest Sky News, the other Sky News, um, available. There are some at each end. If you would like a copy, please uh, take one with you, and or if you think somebody would like to uh, look at it, you know, take one for that, because uh, we have quite a lot of this time of year. Um, we have currently 276 members on the list. We have 178 because we just got a new uh, family membership, but uh, the other family members haven't shown up yet. So. Excellent. And then there are six people whose membership has ex have expired, um, so my, maybe minus six. So, okay. so around two seven, in the low 270s. Very good. Thank you, Brad. Um, outreach coordinator, um, we uh, are looking at possibly breaking this uh, job, which can be quite intimidating, into more of a committee role and having certain people ad, uh, adopt a certain, certain event and, and uh, ease it off a little bit there, because it is a daunting challenge. The first main outreach program of the year will occur on August, uh, pardon me, uh, April 27th, and that is going to be Astronomy Day, and we'll start uh, uh, sorting that out pretty soon. Um, Sid, schools? Schools, yes. We have been very, very busy with the schools, Dorothy, uh, sorry, Diane and um, Lori. They have been just a busy, busy volunteers, shall we say. Yeah. We so far had 37 outings with the schools and also Nightside Moon uh, at Lockside, not Lockside, the, one of the schools, forgot their name. Um, Frank House, yeah. 
where more than 100 kids and the parents showed up. And thank you very much for people who volunteered. <coughs> and none of the volunteers are here. Still recovering? <laughs> yeah, they're still recovering. Yeah. And so we got uh, so far 100. Uh, 1,134 gallon per moment. Uh, the last event was a STEM at um, Glenline North Fork. There are more than 300 kids were present uh, wanting more information. Uh, our STEAM peasant was one of the volunteers. Thank you very much. Jackson, David, me, and Michael Wheatley, and Clayton, and of course, Lori was there too. It was a busy time. We were off for four thirty. You left early, but you had yeah. you were busy. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> and uh, the coming events coming two night sky viewing coming on January tenth and uh, and January fifteenth. I would need some volunteers <coughs> if you would like to uh, show your telescope to the kids and show some interesting objects in the sky. Um, let me know what I would be calling you to help. Yeah. And um, I think that's it. Yeah. So it's going strong. So far we have 57 bookings for this group for this year. It's an incredible program. Thanks very much. Matt, uh, the technical Nothing really new this last few months. Okay, very good. Um, Joe uh, is not here, so no, nothing to review on the website. Um, I did post the, uh, the Sky News on the website, and I found out for some reason some of the hyperlinks is we transferred from uh, Microsoft to PDF. They, they did not make it open, they're not all functional, so that, we'll work on that in the near future. And uh, Michelle, for observing, he is not here. I know we had an opportunity last weekend to use the um, plastic telescope, but things just did not work out too well. And so that's that. So uh, um, I'm not sure if we've got another plastic night scheduled. Do, do you know? And this week should be a UVic telescope night, but of course the weather forecast looks. Yeah, so I, I was just, terrible. So I, I think we'll just not bother to even try. Things. No, I just talked to Karun and we set it up for the second Friday of January. Yeah. So uh, that that's a 32 inch telescope that you uh, you get on Friday nights at seven. So up up and coming events. Um, first of all, uh, uh, our regular Saturday evenings at the Victoria Center Observatory. You have to be on the active observers list to uh, get notification. To do that. So if you are not on the active observers list and would like to be, please uh, contact Chris. Um, Astro Cafe, um, it's going to be cancelled for Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, but we still have one final session to go. And here we all are last week, uh, we had a great uh, group there. But we have four new people here. Chris, could you add them to the membership? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, if you haven't been to Astro Cafe, it is a great session. You do not have to be a member. This is a good way to have uh, ask questions and answers. And uh, it is uh, located uh, in the uh, school grounds of um, Sir James Douglas School in Fairfield. And we have detailed uh, directions on how to get there. Um, also, we uh, the thing to mention is on New Year's Day we're going to have a flight <coughs> of um, uh, New Horizon spacecraft, uh, and it is heading towards a, a piece of rock called MU69. It's a Kuiper Belt object, and uh, Ultima Thule, I think is what they right, call it. Right. Ultima Thule. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so uh, one of the people, J.J. Cavallars, who was involved in finding uh, this particular um, target, and he's going to be talking to us in the March uh, <coughs> meeting, uh, monthly meeting, and he will have some results by that time. And uh, so they, they called it a Tima Thule, 
they had a big competition to come up with this name. I thought, where are they coming with these weird names from? But uh, it, it means something beyond the known worlds or something like that, which is quite appropriate. Um, but uh, it looks like uh, we will start to get uh, some sort of a good health signal from the spacecraft around uh, uh, 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on uh, New Year's morning. So it would be worthwhile sitting up for that all night. <laughs> and and it's a, the reason it takes six hours for the, the signal to transfer from the satellite uh, back to Earth. So it's just think how weak that signal must be by the time it gets there. And so data will trickle in at a very slow rate over the next several uh, weeks. But it'll be really exciting to see what uh, uh, JJ has uh, to uh, share with us in March, the March meeting. Um, the, uh, we mentioned uh, we squared away the uh, next monthly meeting uh, is on January 9th at 7.30. Miss back in our original room at 8104 for the Palm Wright Center. And we have the uh, UVic uh, Observatory on the 9th, uh, on the 11th of uh, January, Friday, and it starts at 7, and it's welcome to everybody. You don't have to be on the all observers list for that. Um, and our council meeting normally falls on the first Wednesday of the month, which is January 2nd, and we thought we would be too weary after the big uh, flyby party for uh, MU69 uh, to, uh, to make that. So we're going to have that on January 16th instead at 7.30 in the, um, uh, the astronomy lounge in the LF building. And uh, David Lee mentioned that uh, we have a total lunar eclipse coming up. Uh, so we'll have more details on that. So something uh, to look forward to. The third week of, of um, uh, January is not well known for clear skies, but maybe we'll look in. That's it. Um, the, the, uh, Lori, did you have any uh, thing of, uh, as a as a rep, a national rep, or, or are you connected with that at all? Um, with the lunar eclipse? No, no. Oh, Nationally, are 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 you out of? Is it just Nelson uh, involved in that right now? Well, Nelson uh, Nelson is the is the rep, yeah. for sure. But um, uh, so I haven't been. I know that there was a meeting. Um, but they had a they had a meeting. So you didn't hear it. So I didn't really hear too much more about okay. that. Thanks, Chris. He um, might help. <laughs> Chris, Chris, Chris might might address that in the talk. So. But just well enough. I have two calendars left. So if anybody wants a calendar, come and see me. Oh, oh there's another one there? Is there no, is that another one? I've got one soul. One is not yet claimed. Okay, all right, because I've got a couple of people. Pam Norton, is Pam Norton here? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, so go ahead. Right. Lord, She's got uh, hers. You have yours. Yeah. Good, okay. And uh, Colin Fraser. Is Colin Fraser here? Okay, all right. All right, so I might have more than one. Available. So come see me if you would like them. They're $15 a piece. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they're here before January 1st. <laughs> so I'll, at this time, I'll ask the acting vice president to introduce our, <laughs> our speaker. And second vice um, And we'll get his uh, presentation up here. What if he says no? <laughs> <laughs> Well, at any rate, uh, pretty much everyone knows about Chris, and I, I just did a little bit of digging today, and, and something oh, oh. came out. <laughs> <laughs> I, many of you might know that Chris was a, a journalist for the Vancouver Sun, and uh, way back when, he received the Newspaper Award of the Year, National Award, for his uh, work covering uh, Terry Fox's adventure. So, so that's, that's great. So, but he also has had a rich uh, uh, set of opportunities studying space programs and things like that. And he got a PhD in uh, technical history from the University of Alberta. And I think it's a brilliant thing. The guy is doing work on what he loves to, to study. Which is, and he's written five books already. Uh, one of them was uh, Who Killed the Avril Well? But his first book, I uh, dealt with some of the scientists from the AV Road Company 
who went down to the states and got involved in the Apollo program and uh, is kind of uh, relevant because we're coming up to the 50th anniversary of that occasion, so that might be an interesting resource. Um, he's uh, currently under contract with NASA to write the official history of the Hubble Space Program. So, and besides that, he could even give us comments on the uh, national status of RASC. So, <laughs> I don't know if you have anything to say, but please a warm welcome for uh, this Thank you, yes, uh, uh, I did a number of stories when I worked for the Vancouver Sun, uh, uh, some involving space, but you know, when the internet uh, got started, you know, you, you, the first time you, you uh, I think we used all of Vista or something back then, but the first time I Googled myself, and I think the, uh, the, the story I did that came up, the only thing that I had on the internet was a story I did at the Sun about the Sasquatch. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually think that some people, yeah. Some people what was thought, your conclusion? <laughs> well, that was a hilarious story. What happened is that the Sasquatch turned up at the Lummi Indian Reserve, you know, just south of the border. And uh, and the Lummi police had take this this, this thing, and they had it on the Art Finley show on CKW, you know, very well known hotliner at the time. You know, this is like back in the 70s. And so, uh, so they played it on the show, and uh, and the whole newsroom was just sitting there waiting for this to come on. And then, you know, finally, after upbeat commercials, and you know, we got, you know, they sort of built up the, the thing, and then all of a sudden, this sort of high pitched scream came on. And the whole place exploded <laughs> with laughter. But anyway, I had to do the story, and, uh, and that that uh, I suspect that's that's probably one of the. Uh, oh yes, and then there was another thing um, with a Terry Long story. I, I collaborated with a guy named Tim Padmore, and we did another story together. Uh, there was a. a a great deal of interest in peyote, or sorry, the uh, magic mushrooms, and and people were coming down and, and harvesting magic mushrooms and then uh, selling them. Like my my cousin came down from Calgary and was harvesting them. But anyway, uh, somebody decided that somebody should actually try this and share this with the readers. So my friend Tim Padmore uh, uh, came down to my place and. Uh, it was the magic mushrooms, and we had a doctor there, you know, physician, and he took them, and then he wrote about them, and then I wrote a story about what Tim was like when he was taking these mushrooms. So when, uh, in more, more than one occasion, when people heard that, you know, I and Tim had won this award, they assumed it was for the magic mushrooms. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, before before I get going, uh, actually, I just you know I literally left my desk to to, to jump in the car from a, a, a national um, a board meeting and uh, uh, which which we had over the phone. And I can't uh, <coughs> I can't think of anything really really truly ex exciting to impart. Uh, you know, we're working on trying to restructure some of the committees. Um, we want to restructure uh, some of the education, uh, our educational stuff, and we're consulting with them. And we're going to be setting up a communications committee as well. Actually, one thing we did is that, is that this evening we officially uh, brought into being the uh, uh, Inclusiveness and Diversity Committee. Um, and uh, uh, so we'll be uh, publicizing that uh, that fairly soon. And it's just kind of a, a place to go, you know, if, for for people who are in uh, groups that have, you know, historically not been well represented in our membership, and and uh, you know, kind of a place to them for them to come together. And uh, and you know, we think it'll be it'll be good. You know, we want we want to make sure 
that uh, that uh, our membership uh, looks a little bit more like the, the country we live in than it does now. Um, and I guess the other thing is that, of course, uh, uh, we're working on getting ready for the uh, General Assembly. It's going to be in roughly the, uh, in Toronto at York University, uh, roughly in the middle of June, as opposed to the long weekend. And uh, uh, our lab, we had a GA at, uh, at York uh, about 11 or 12 years ago. This time, the subway goes up to York, so you're not trapped there. And we have uh, uh, better facilities. Uh, so, uh, and it's going to be a joint meeting with the AABSO, the Variable Star Observer. So, I think it's going to be a good thing. Uh, we're going to have a special speaker, uh, Jim Hansen, who wrote the biography of Neil Armstrong, uh, uh, that was used for the for the movie, and uh, and I'll probably be talking a little bit about. Uh, you know, Canada's role and follow, but of course, uh, uh, Jim is, is the big draw. So anyway, uh, I'm just going to put that bug in your ear. Um, and uh, so I'm going to I'm going to turn to uh, to Hubble right now. And I just got back from uh, Washington a couple of days ago. I, mean, I went down last week. And actually, the main reason I was down there uh, was. Uh, uh, sort of a, a gaggle of uh, us space historians were having a meeting to talk about how we were going to uh, uh, come up with some new ideas for uh, uh, history uh, around the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. So probably the, the work we were doing uh, last week won't bear fruit for some time. Uh, but we thought uh, NASA and uh, the Smithsonian thought it would be a good chance to just uh, uh, get together and also start to think about new ways of doing that history because a lot, of, you know, a lot of the, the history around Apollo is, uh, you know, it's, it's been done to death and, and, and we actually uh, did get some good ideas. I thought it was a good meeting. and. Once I agreed to, uh, or decided to go to that meeting, I found out that uh, there was going to be a celebration in another part of Washington that day, because last week was the 25th anniversary of the first servicing mission to Hubble. And, uh, uh, and I have a lot of memories of that. I had no idea that I would ever be involved in any way in, in Hubble myself, but being a space nut, uh, I got up in the middle of the night and I found that a lot of other people did to watch the uh, spacewalks because uh, the, uh, the cable systems back then, even up here in Canada, uh, decided to brought, put on NASA TV on one of their empty channels during that servicing mission. So we were able to follow it. And being a bit of a pack rat, I taped a lot of it. And of course, I later had use for those tapes. But I'm, uh, uh, anyway, I'm going to uh, 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 start in on my uh, on my talk, and uh, I think this is. I know I've given this talk to to uh, a monthly meeting at least once before. I think uh, the first time I did it, I barely got this contract from NASA. So actually, I knew I knew. I probably didn't know a heck of a lot more than most of the people in the audience at that time. I, I'd like to think I do now. So I did, uh, 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 NASA Goddard decided about uh, three or four years ago that they wanted a, uh, a book written about Hubble operations. And uh, they had a competition <coughs> by one. Uh, and, uh, so I've been working on it for three years. Now, I've actually fulfilled that contract, but they still have to make a decision about publishing the book. So I'm hoping it's not going to be too long before I'll have an announcement about uh, uh, who's going to be publishing it and perhaps a bit of a schedule. But uh, I suspect it'll be a couple of years. You know, the year after next is going to be the 30th anniversary. I'd like to think I'm ready for that, but it's going to be challenging to do that. So. We'll see how it goes. 
but uh, I'll probably be doing a, a bit more work on it. But uh, uh, anyway, right now I'm taking a bit of a break from it, but I'm, I'm keeping, I'm certainly keeping track of things because there's there's new developments, and then you know, uh, even in the past few days, which I'll talk about a little bit. So, so. Uh, um, Hubble is named after uh, this fellow here, Ed, Edwin P. Hubble, and uh, uh, and we're coming up on the 100th anniversary of Hubble uh, Hubble's work, which basically determined that the universe the universe is a lot bigger than a lot of people thought it was. You know, uh, uh, it certainly wasn't unanimous, but uh, uh, up to about 100 years ago, a lot of people thought that. The Milky Way was the full extent of the universe, and that these faint fuzzy spots were actually inside the Milky Way. Uh, the Andromeda Nebula was called, or, or the Andromeda Galaxy was called the Andromeda Nebula back then, and uh, and Hubble was able to establish that uh, that uh, Andromeda was indeed a galaxy of its own. Uh, much uh, 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 very far away from us, and uh, and that revolutionized astronomy. It also, uh, when NASA decided to name it after Hubble, it actually kind of pointed to some of the work that the Hubble telescope would be doing, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Let's see. Okay, let's see. Okay, I'll do it this way. This is the arrow pieces. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, uh, Lyman Spitzer, who spent most of his career at Princeton, I believe, uh, uh, is, uh, is generally acknowledged to be the, the, uh, uh, father of of the Hubble telescope, and in 19, uh, 1946, uh, the Rand, uh, what became the Rand Corporation, started a series of studies about about uh, satellites in space, and Spitzer wrote the first detailed paper about uh, a, a telescope in orbit around the Earth. Uh, the idea had been thought of by others, including Kermit Oberg, before that. But Spitzer was the first person to really think about it in detail. And he spent a lot of his career lobbying to have, uh, to have uh, uh, space telescopes uh, launched, uh, in, and especially Hubble. And uh, he actually... Uh, uh, lived to, to use Hubble uh, uh, himself, and it was actually very influential in running it, uh, you know, up, up to the end of his life. So, uh, and actually, I think, uh, I, I, saw, I saw something on the uh, internet the other day that, uh, that uh, this week is the 50th anniversary of the launch of uh, the second orbiting astronomical observatory. Which is actually kind of the first one that worked, but uh, it was it was uh, a much uh, uh, smaller scale thing than Hubble, and it was just basically doing uh, spectroscopy and things like that. So it didn't have much of a profile with uh, with the public, but uh, it was a it was an important thing. So Hubble was not the first uh, the first. Uh, uh, space telescope by any means. There was a, a number of others. So, I think most of the people here, I, I don't need to explain too much uh, uh, why, uh, what the idea behind Hubble is. Of course, we want to get above uh, the clouds and all the liquid sunshine that we enjoy here. Uh, and also the, the effects of the atmosphere on seeing and all that stuff. But of course, you want to get uh, 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 a wider, uh, uh, I guess, a window or wider selection of wavelengths to uh, 
uh, to shoot. And uh, uh, so that's because there's there are uh, a lot of types of light that are blocked out by the uh, by the atmosphere, and that's fortunately fortunate for us, and not so fortunate for astronomy. And uh, so Hubble, uh, the work on Hubble really got going in 1977. Uh, but uh, uh, later on, uh, NASA got approval for uh, other, <coughs> other large space telescopes looking at, uh, at different parts of the spectrum. And uh, uh, Hubble was the first you see there. It, uh, it, it shoots in optical wavelengths and also, also a certain part of the ultraviolet and also uh, near infrared. We have uh, the, uh, uh, we have one uh, that, that operates actually in past tense, it doesn't, it's uh, no longer operating, but uh, in the infrared, which is named after uh, Spitzer. Uh, Chandra uh, operates in uh, X-ray wavelengths, um, and it was launched in 1999 by the, by the shuttle, and the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, which is, which is also uh, no longer uh, operational. But uh, together, these uh, these uh, spacecraft provide all sorts of information on the universe that's not available from Earth. Um, so, um, so this is, uh, this is a, a, a chart of, of Hubble. You can see near the bottom, uh, you have a a, a set of uh, instruments there that kind of look like phone booths and there's a, a number of different instruments I'm going to give you the li uh, list in a minute and then above there above uh, then there's the uh, the uh, uh, some instruments that kind of look almost like uh, baby grand pianos they look more like it when they're pulled out and uh, three of them are are uh, 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 control uh, fine guidance sensors, and one of them is a camera, and then they are right under the mirror, and uh, it's a it's a, uh, a, a Ritchie uh, Cretien uh, reflecting telescope, and uh, you can see the other systems and the solar arrays. Those are the uh, that chart shows the original uh, solar arrays. So, the Hubble is almost unimaginable without the shuttle because the, the shuttle meant that the uh, instruments could be changed out at, at regular um, intervals during, during the mission. And so I've just, I've just put in a list of the different instruments that have flown on Hubble um, they, they come in. They come in various types, and uh, so the result is is, is that Hubble uh, has has instruments that are much more up to date and much more powerful than what it had when it was launched. And and uh, um, so it's uh, uh, and and of course the older instruments have been able to be changed out. Uh, as, as the uh, as they wear out or, or run into uh, run into problems. And uh, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure with this telescope. It's not just a, it's not just a telescope there. Uh, it has other infrastructure in space, these teeter satellites, which are actually used for a lot of uh, all sorts of different satellites. Uh, uh, data goes, uh, uh, commands from Earth uh, go through these satellites down to the Hubble. They're up in geosynchronous orbit. And of course, the data goes back to Earth via these satellites. 
Then you go down to the Goddard Space Flight Center uh, in the, the suburbs of uh, Washington, D.C. And the, the scientific work is done at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Just, what, half hour drive if you're, if you've got a break in the traffic uh, from, from Goddard on the, uh, in Baltimore, uh, on the uh, campus of Johns Hopkins University. So uh, there was a lot of, when, when Hubble was being created, there was a lot of discussion about how it was going to be run. Uh, uh, NASA typically run these missions, and, and the, the uh, scientists insisted uh, that they needed uh, something that was a bit more under their control to handle the scientific end of, uh, of Hubble operations. So that's what they got. And I think it's been seen as, as uh, that's fairly successful. So, after many delays, including three or four years caused uh, by the loss of the Space Shuttle Challenger in 1986, uh, Hubble was launched in 1990. Um, in terms, uh, you know, of course, the uh, uh, the costs of that accident were terrible in, in, in terms of the human life, but it, uh, uh, one of the uh, benefits of it was that uh, Hubble was actually in much better shape because of the extra four years it had on the ground. There was a, probably uh, a, a number of serious problems that were uh, evaded uh, uh, because they had more time to work on it. Uh, I won't, I won't go into that in detail, but uh, anyway, it was launched. There was a great deal of excitement. Uh, Hubble was finally being launched, and uh, it was going to revolutionize astronomy. So, um, and you can see there it was released, uh, released by the uh, by the Canada. Let's see. So. One of the most uh, embarrassing, uh, and embarrass is maybe a kind word for it, uh, incidents in the history of NASA took place. Hubble was launched and they found out that the mirror had been ground perfectly to the wrong shape. Um, and uh, of course this, uh, this tale will be a major part of my book. Uh, the mirror was ground around 1980 or 81, nearly nearly a decade before the launch. And actually, most of the people uh, responsible for that were long gone. It's, it's kind of a, a complicated string of circumstances that led to it. But basically, somebody decided to cut corners in testing. That's kind of what it boiled down to. They, uh, something in the, the main testing rig <coughs> didn't quite fit right, so they just, somebody decided, well, let's put in a couple of washers and, and, and we'll get it to, to work right. And uh, so it meant it was ground and, and tested to the wrong shape. And then somebody else decided, well, let's, we, we're going to do these extra tests, but let's save a few bucks. When, when the, that mirror was being made, it, it was a time of, of great financial stress and managerial stress in the program. So uh, they assumed it was perfect. There was a great deal of, of uh, shall we say, boasting about how great the mirror was. And of course, it took people like weeks to really accept that when these pictures came down and it showed spherical aberration, that that's what it was. It really took people some time to uh, wrap their minds around it. Uh, so, uh, about two months after the launch, in late June of 1990, uh, they had a big uh, press conference with the top officials from Hubble and announced this thing. And uh, you, you can see some of the results here. Yeah. It, 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 uh, uh, it, uh, it was a matter of great anger because so much money had been spent, uh, but of course the butt of a lot of jokes. 
you know, including, I don't know if anybody saw a make <coughs> done two and a half, uh, but there's a scene in there where, uh, you know, Frank Drevin, the Leslie uh, Nielsen character, is depressed because his girlfriend has just broken up with him and he goes to like the Losers Cafe and he went in there and there's pictures of a Hindenburg and, and uh, you know, the, the Challenger and, uh, you know, all, every disaster you can imagine, the San Francisco earthquake and there's Hubble, you know, and, uh, and uh, it's kind of funny, but, you know, there's some people who, who uh, took this very personally, uh, you know, and some people took to the bottle and all this. It, it was it was uh, very difficult. Uh, <coughs> but uh, uh, what happened is that uh, is that people generally uh, within the project responded to it in the best way possible. Uh, the people. Uh, uh, People went to work to find out what had happened and how can we make this right. And uh, so, for example, the the test apparatus was was uh, was found and it basically just been even though it's gigantic, uh, it was just left in the corner of the plant at, at exactly as it had been when it had been used to test Hubble. So they were able to figure out. Uh, what had gone wrong, and they were also able, with uh, looking at the uh, other test results with a bit more of a jaundiced eye, they were able to figure out the precise shape of the mirror, which is absolutely vital if they were going to fix it. And then, uh, then they went to work uh, on figuring out how to do it. Now, um, there um, there were two things. There was a couple of things that were going to fall into place. There were already servicing missions scheduled uh, because that, you know, as I said, it's kind of part and parcel of the way Hubble was designed. So there were astronauts that were going to go there and they were going to be able to do things. And uh, 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 Ed Weiler who was a big, big wheel in NASA. He had already actually had people at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory working on a new main camera instrument for Hubble, uh, the uh, uh, wide-field planetary camera. They were already working on, a, on what they call the WIFTIC-2, uh, the, the, the second one. And so uh, very quickly, the folks at uh, JPL, once they knew what they had to do in terms of the uh, correcting for the shape of the mirror, they, they uh, inserted some mirrors inside that instrument and uh, uh, which basically reversed the effects of the, the mirror defect. Um, but there's a number, there was uh, all these other instruments on, on, on Hubble. The, the camera was one instrument, the wide field camera was one instrument. There were still four other instruments. And so, what they decided to do, um, are, are the, there's all sorts of ideas talked about, including having an ast astronauts, uh, you know, climb into the mirror and and, uh, and and put a big piece of glass at the top or a corrector plate, all sorts of ideas. Um, and these ideas were coming from the Space Telescope Science Institute and the director at the time who just let his people loose on it was a guy named Ricardo G. Coney, um, who was a legendary figure uh, uh, around the Institute and also around NASA. He was actually an X-ray astronomer. And a lot of people credit him with getting that whole field going, and he did win the Nobel Prize for that. But he wasn't afraid to tell NASA where to take some of its ideas. So he was not very popular around there, uh, around NASA. He was beloved at the Institute, but he let his people uh, uh, just go to work and try and figure out how, how, how they could uh, fix these other instruments. Now, I'm, I usually don't mention Giacconi that much, but 
Uh, G. Cody passed away on Sunday, um, and uh, uh, he's out. Uh, He's one of the most important figures in this story. Uh, unfortunately, I never met him. Maybe Jim did, but I'm sure you did. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, the people at the Institute were thinking of all these ideas. And then, the, and then they were thinking, well, how could we, how could we uh, correct the light going from, from the, uh, the telescope optics into the instruments? And uh, and they were talking about, well, we could, we could get these little lenses, but how do we get them in the light trains? And there's a guy, actually an engineer, who, who was kind of like one of the number two or three people at the, uh, at the Institute, a guy named Jim Crocker. And they were in a meeting in, uh, in, uh, near Munich in Germany trying to figure out how to do this. And uh, Crocker was uh, going to take a shower. And it was one of these European showers that were not common in North America, but are now, where you have the, uh, the head that moves around and up and down. And he thought, this is what we need to, uh, to put the mirrors in the, in the right place to correct for this. So they, they took out one of the instruments, the high-speed photometer, um, and, and put in a, a new instrument called Star, which just basically stuck these mirrors out and redirected the light to the other instruments. They sacrificed one instrument for, for uh, th three other instruments. Now, um, the, the precision work that was required to, to create the Star is, is just amazing. Uh, um, you'll just have to read the book. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 you just you just think oh well you just you just uh, make the reverse of that it's just uh, it just doesn't even begin to, to scratch the surface of the problems they had to solve and meanwhile NASA was suffering all sorts of other setbacks you know Mars Observer wasn't working and and uh, they were having shuttle problems and Galileo's antenna wouldn't come out. And a lot of people said, you know, maybe it's time to uh, bomb NASA. They did get a bit of a break for the publicity on Hubble, uh, uh, thanks to a fellow named Saddam Hussein, because uh, when he invaded Kuwait, it was a month after, after the uh, uh, problem with uh, Hubble had been found. So it actually took the focus away. Uh, so they were able to do their work quietly, but everybody knew that if that servicing mission didn't work, that might be the end of NASA. Uh, so, uh, and it was going to be the most, most ambitious space at that time. You, you had uh, teams of two astronauts doing a spacewalk every day for five days, like they would, they would take, uh, take turns. And there's going to be instruments being changed out on it. There are also other problems with Hubble. Uh, the uh, solar panels were creating problems. They were shaking. It was called the jitter problem. And that was, uh, so they decided to change out the solar, uh, the solar panels. They, as usual, they had to change out the gyroscopes. And, you know, there, there were just other things that had to be done. And, uh, but the, uh, the astronauts for that crew uh, really, really changed hard, uh, and trained hard for that. Uh, there's a fellow named Story Musgrave, who's probably kind of the face of that mission. And uh, uh, they were training in simulated space environments. And uh, he actually got frostbite on his hands during training. And they flew him up to Alaska to be treated. But he, uh, so they uh, included some heaters in the uh, gloves that they used when they flew, and he got over it before the mission. But uh, there was a lot of dedication that went into that, uh, that servicing mission. So they, uh, uh, this is actually a photo from a, a, a later servicing mission. But, uh, you know, they had to fill the, uh, the cargo bay with new instruments and tools and also backups. Uh, for those tools and, and using the Canadar. 
there's actually a very unsung, but there's a huge amount of work that went into uh, in, uh, preparing the instruments and everything else. Uh, uh, servicing issues. As time went on, they were starting to do work that was not contemplated when Hubble was designed, changing out units that were not supposed to be changed out. And there's a guy there named Frank Cepelina. I saw him at the party on Saturday night. He's just an amazing guy. Um, the, the father of satellite servicing, although in honor of his Italian heritage, and uh, one of the astronauts is joking that he's the godfather of satellite servicing. Uh, and uh, they would just think of these ideas. You know, there were some instruments that were changed out. You had like a hundred screws that you had to change to take something out and then and then put a new one in. And you don't want you don't want one or two screws floating around in there, let alone a hundred. And they came up with a gizmo that would capture all the screws, you know, without uh, 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 it's a it's just amazing how well these servicing missions work. So uh, uh, this mission was a success. The, the first servicing mission was a success, and then at the uh, at the AAS meeting uh, a couple of weeks later, beginning of January of, uh, of 1994, uh, I think that was in Washington somewhere, or they uh, uh, brought out the first pictures, and and uh, and Hubble had been fixed, and. Uh, uh, that was actually the beginning because, you know, uh, for the first few months of 1994, people would say uh, the, the, the repaired Hubble telescope or the troubled Hubble telescope. But here's another amazing picture. And actually, even before the uh, servicing mission, it was actually still doing a lot of good science. So it was still. Well, of course, a few months after the, uh, these pictures came out, we had the uh, uh, Shoemaker Levy 9. Uh, a lot of us were able to see that with our own beady eyes. I know I had, uh, I, I, I could see some of the time. But, uh, uh, you know, Hubble was able to get really good photos and the first photos. Uh, and so uh, my friend Ray Villard, the PR guy for Hubble, uh, you know, said after SL9, uh, it was just Hubble. And people quickly forgot uh, <clears throat> its history. You know, Hubble became uh, a, a symbol of American success, actually. You know, uh, uh, 1994 was when I first met Ray, and I remember he, his slideshow back then had a huge, he had all his cartoons I showed you and everything else. Cause, but uh, he's, after, after a while, he'd have to explain to people what that was about. You know, some people don't forget, but some people do. Uh, so throughout, throughout the life of, uh, of Hubble, uh, it's had a, a series of, uh, of servicing missions, and and uh, I'm not uh, I'm not going to go into great detail here, uh, but I, I do in the book, and uh, uh, each, each of them was was kind of different from the others. Some, uh, you know, some had to get up because Hubble was in trouble because all the gyros had gone or all of one of them. For being out of equipment, but the last one was nine years ago now. Well, getting on, we're getting on to almost ten years ago, which is much longer than any of the gaps before then. And uh, and fortunately, um, uh, they were uh, able to put in some gyroscopes that work better than the previous ones. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but the gyroscopes have a limited life. And uh, uh, if we're nine years old from any other, other servicing missions, Hubble will be dead by now, effectively. And, uh, uh, but that's, that's not the case now. It still has uh, three good gyroscopes. There was a couple of weeks in October 
where it looks like we have two, but uh, we have uh, we have three good ones. So each of those servicing missions was very ambitious and represented a, a huge amount of work. Also, a lot of work by the, by astronomers. You know what what instrument servicing missions and instruments had to be new instruments had to be developed. And there's sometimes clever ideas behind them. So I talk about that uh, in the book. But I don't want to keep you here all night. So, of course, uh, uh, Hubble uh, has has become famous <coughs> for its 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 amazing uh, photos, as I say here. And you know, I could I could. Uh, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's hundreds of them. It's quite an interesting tale, and, and something that interests me is the influence that Hubble has had on what we as amateur photographers do. That I'm, I'm not really known as, uh, as one of the astral photographers in here, but there are a number here. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I think Hubble has, you know, influenced the work that, uh, that, professional and amateur astral photographers do. Hubble happened to come along at, at the same time as the internet. And Hubble, uh, I often thought that Hubble um, is to the internet what Apollo 11 was to television. You know, Hubble is um, uh, one of the, some of the first really massive downloads of images came from Hubble, and I'm going to show you that image a little later. Um, and uh, uh, and then uh, the, the, the folks who worked at, uh, at the, the Space Telescope Institute had to process these pictures for release to the public. And of course, in some cases, the, these, these photos, uh, such as the famous Pillars of Creation, uh, photo, uh, which is on my sock, my socks. <laughs> I, I got them at the at the uh, Washington Airport when I was flying home. I said, "Oh, I should, I should have my colors of creation socks on." I talk about how. Anyway, there's a, there's a guy there who just retired. I think I think. Uh, a couple of days ago, he, uh, he and his wife just uh, moved away from Maryland, I think to Minnesota, a guy named Zolt LeVay. And, uh, and he and Ray Villard, uh, the PR guy, they, uh, they were working on, 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 on how, how to process these photos. And they, they uh, along with the astronomers, developed what's known as the Hubble palette, which is uh, uh, used, uh, you know, how to select uh, uh, colors uh, for, for processing because every image from Hubble is actually black and white and then and, and taken through different filters and then they're, they're assembled together. And uh, so they, they not only, uh, uh, you know, use these to process the photos, but they publicized what they did, you know, like when Whenever any media came calling, they were always happy to explain what they did. They wrote an article about it in Sky and Telescope. Uh, there's something on the website. Um, so, uh, uh, and this has been widely shared in the, in, in the community. So, uh, the, the photos, the photos are, uh, you know, of, of more than just, you know, kind of aesthetic or academic interest. Uh, to us, um, so uh, now this is not the original pillars uh, uh, of creation photo, but they uh, they took it again in optical and infrared wavelengths and released it at the uh, AAS what three three or four years ago now. Uh, cameras. The original one was done with WIFPIC 2, and I think this might be uh, uh, with the, whatever the WIFC, I think, is the, the latest one. Uh, but uh, anyway, just uh, 
just a, amazing photos. But you know, Hubble is is a lot more. The work with Hubble is a lot more than that. Uh, than just uh, taking photos. Of course, a lot of work is uh, spectroscopy. And then, then there's then there's the uh, the important work of figuring out the uh, size of the universe, and the age of the universe, and the composition. And uh, and Hubble was in the middle of that. Uh, but I think it's it's important to say that it it was uh, it was just part of a whole set of work being done by astronomers at various uh, uh, instruments on Earth uh, who were trying to figure out how far uh, uh, stars are from us. Now I, I think I think most of us here have some familiarity with this work. It's kind of a, a ladder of things you look at, starting with the, the Cepheid variables, which um, are known to be a certain distance from us. And then uh, uh, you start out with uh, Cepheids that are close to us and then uh, nearby galaxies. And eventually, uh, it's, too, it's too far. So you start looking at certain types of supernovae, which have certain characteristics. And uh, there's a lot of fine work that has to be done to figure out their size. You know, we don't, we can't say that, that say a certain Cepheid variable is a precise size. We're a lot closer to that now today than we were 30 years ago. And there's still work being done on it today with other spacecraft like Gaia, I think, is doing some important work on, on that stuff. But, uh, the uh, uh, the important work that Hubble was done with, I think, was mainly with the uh, the supernovae, and a lot of work was done using uh, using observatories in Hawaii and Chile. But Hubble could be used to do some of the really fine work, and uh, and so uh, this uh, this led to. Uh, uh, you know, one of the more astonishing uh, uh, universe is expanding, which we all already knew, but it, it's expanding at an accelerating rate. I think before then, most people thought it was accelerating at a, or it was actually, its expansion was decelerating. Not everybody, but uh, but most people, and then this brings along uh, uh, the idea of dark energy, and, you know, and of course we're already having enough fun trying to deal with uh, dark matter. Um, so, uh, so that's an important thing, and and uh, uh, the astronomers who uh, the, the the leaders, the, there were two teams of astronomers that were. That were working on that, and they they got the Nobel Prize, uh, including uh, Adam Reese, who works over at the uh, Space Telescope Institute. Uh, but uh, the whole list of the discoveries is a very long one. But I thought uh, I thought this was kind of a, a representative list, you know, uh, supermassive black holes. Like not your garden variety black holes, but supermassive black holes in galaxies. Uh, when Hubble was launched, there was a lot of talk about uh, it being used for extrasolar planets. Now, because Hubble isn't a survey telescope, that, it was, that was never really in the cards. But when these extrasolar planets are discovered on Earth, Hubble can be aimed at them. And, uh, and, and get images, but spectroscopic in, uh, information about their composition of, the, of their atmospheres and things like that. It's also been quite useful for uh, astronomy in the solar system. Uh, this object that we're going to be looking at on or after New Year's, that New Horizons is going by, was basically found uh, by Hubble. Uh, and uh, uh, and also Hubble was useful to aim 
New Horizons at Pluto. So it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's been useful for a lot of things in solar system astronomy. So if I had to pick out one image that I think was important, it's this one. And uh, it's not only uh, it's not only important because of its scientific value. Uh, this was actually one of the first big uh, photo releases that was downloaded on a massive scale uh, on the internet. Because this is just this came out. Uh, I think uh, it was taken late in 1995 and released at the AAS. I think that one was down in Texas somewhere. Uh, at the beginning of 1996, and uh, and by then a lot of people had uh, uh, computers that could download pho uh, download photos, including yours truly. I remember downloading that thing. Uh, but anyway, there was a big argument about uh, what, what Hubble would find if they just took a really long exposure of an empty part of the universe. This is just they found the most boring, nondescript piece of real estate they could in, in Ursa Major, and they aimed it for, for like about 10 days of almost solid shooting. I forget how long the exposure was. Uh, people like John McCall said, you're not going to find anything in a paper in nature, too. It wasn't like this, you know, on the side in a, a coffee clutch. And, uh, the, the director of the institute, a guy named Bob Williams, decided to do this with because he had, in his personal gift, about 10% of all of Hubble's time. Uh, he could do with it whatever he wants. Although, you know, I don't think he, a person in that position never has absolute freedom because they have to answer for it, you know. Uh, if, if, if they had found nothing, he probably <coughs> had a lot of people going after him, although I personally think that if they'd have found nothing, it would have been just as interesting and important. But they found, you know, almost everything here is, is, a, is a galaxy. I think there's just one or two stars in there. And looking very deep and very far away. And uh, this is also uh, an important image in terms of how astronomers do their work. Because there was a massive amount of data that was released, uh, they had people camping out at the institute, like postdocs camping out there, processing it over the Christmas holidays, and they couldn't go home because there was a blizzard or something that went through town, and they wanted to have it all ready for the uh, for the AAS meeting, and then it just went out. And this is like a change from the traditional thing where an <coughs> astronomer would either have the data for as long as they wanted it, which is like in the old days, say at Mount Calamar or something, or or where you get time on Hubble and you can it's all yours for a year, and then and only then is it released to the public. This is released on day one. Massive amount of data and 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 all sorts of people went to work on it and lots of science was found. So so uh, there's been a, a, a whole set of these uh, deep fields uh, since then. Um, and uh, other instruments have been used on them. Other instruments on Hubble, instruments on other space telescopes to get, uh, to get data in uh, other wavelengths. I think even some earthbound telescopes have been used for this. And then, then you have things like this where you can see gravitational lensing. So each of these uh, fields go out uh, farther and farther back in time. And so you can see here uh, uh, how far back we, these things go. These, you know, what we could see before Hubble and then the deep field and the ultra deep field and the uh, yeah, various other things. And of course, they hope to go even deeper with the uh, the, the next telescope. But before we get to that, I'm going to talk a little bit about an interesting little chapter in Hubble. Uh, I was talking about Ricardo Giacconi. Uh, and 
he's actually kind of in the, in the center, a little bit to the left of that photo there. But he decided before Hubble was launched that he was going to use some of his discretionary time to, uh, to uh, let some amateurs propose uh, observations on Hubble. And uh, so they, they worked something on, I think it was, was it the Astronomical League, one of the big groups in the States. Uh, and they, they ran a, a, a selection uh, uh, process. And, uh, and the uh, amateurs uh, came up with some pretty good ideas. But uh, the interesting thing is, is that uh, the, uh, there wasn't a, a huge, there was at the beginning a lot of, a, a, a lot of people applying. But the uh, application process for Hubble time, even for this special circumstances for them, was so rigorous and involved so much work that I think it it uh, it really uh, uh, discouraged a lot of people, I guess. So each round, they got fewer and fewer proposals, um, uh, and uh, an interest uh, an interesting uh, uh, tale was uh, uh, the. Uh, the amateurs, of course, people like, like you and I, and there, there was a woman there, uh, one of them was a, a woman, a homemaker from Seattle, the Anna Larson. And, uh, and, and she, she made a proposal, which was, which was uh, very ambitious, it involved t tori stars and stuff like that. And, and what happened is that uh, when the mirror uh, they had this problem. Her uh, uh, her proposal was actually never carried out. Uh, but you know she'd gotten to go to the Space Telescope Institute, rub shoulders with all the shots of astronomy, and she was so inspired that she decided to go to go back to school. She came here to UVic because she lived in Seattle, and got her PhD, and then went back home. And she's a instructor over at the University of Washington. And, uh, and I asked her, well, uh, didn't you try getting your thing done another time? And uh, she just said, oh, I'm so busy. So, so she never did. But uh, anyway, uh, so this is a, this is a, 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 a bit of a, a, a bitter street thing. And it, it was ended by Bob Williams when he got in. But they're actually, there are actually uh, uh, are other opportunities for uh, for astronomy. Now, a big thing uh, about Hubble is that all its uh, data are available uh, on on its archive. And there's there's of course a couple of places on Earth where. Uh, the, the, the uh, data are archived at the Space Telescope Institute on this archive here, and also at the ESA. I think it's in Spain now. And then there's uh, there's also another archive at the Canadian Astronomy Data Center up on the up on the hill. But uh, there is all this data available, and anybody can access it if you've got the. Uh, you know, you know if you know what you're doing. I guess you have to know all the, you know, the fits format and all this sort of stuff. But uh, but some people actually actually do that. And there are a couple of pictures on the Hubble site that are where you've seen processing. You know, professional astronomers, but so and so who's an amateur helped them out with it. Uh, it's it's not quite as much as what you see from some of the planetary probes. Uh, uh, you know, like for example, Juno, they just put a, they, you know, somebody forced them to put a camera on, you know, because they weren't going to have a camera on that thing. And they said, well, we'll just crowdsource the processing, which is what's happened. But uh, anyway, um, there is, uh, there is that opportunity. And then there's also uh, kind of uh, following the SETI at home thing, there's uh, a couple of, uh, uh, projects where the the work uh, 
has been kind of uh, crowdsourced to citizen scientists. Uh, there's, uh, uh, yes, the Andromeda galaxy, or the panchromatic Hubble Andromeda tapestry or something like that. It's PHAT. And uh, it's run by uh, uh, Julianne Del Canton at the University of Washington. And they, they took, they, they dedicated a huge amount of Hubble time to take these uh, images of, of uh, just a portion of Andromeda. I think they're trying to get uh, all of it. And they had a big release at that AES meeting in Seattle four years ago. But they, they wanted, you could, uh, you know, Andromeda is so big you could see more distant objects through Andromeda, and and there was hundreds of them, or thousands, and and so they crowdsourced the work of trying to suss out where these objects were to uh, amateurs who would look at images and and uh, and there's a couple of other things like that going on, but they're quickly, uh, you know, fully subscribed for that. So uh, anyway. At, the, at that AES uh, four years ago, yeah, they had this gigantic um, uh, uh, mural of Andromeda. It's just amazing. And uh, um, and I, I don't want you to quote me, but I have it on good authority that a similar thing is going to be done for M33 at the AES uh, next month. So uh, anyway, um, uh, So just to kind of wind things up, of course, we're uh, we're eagerly awaiting the, the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, Canada was not formally involved in Hubble, although of course uh, we did play a role in the archive, as I mentioned. But of course, we have a, a lot of skin in this game, and uh, 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 the people who run Hubble are looking forward to a. Uh, uh, at least two years of joint operations with JWST when it's launched. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the allocations of time on Hubble are, are uh, being done in anticipation of JWST. Because JWST works in the infrared and, and Hubble has ultraviolet capabilities, I think if you come up with an ultraviolet project, when Hubble comes out, the ultraviolet folks are going to be out of luck for a while. Um, and uh, yeah, one of the great things uh, uh, I was able to do while working on this project it was to sneak into Building 28 and see how they were doing with uh, JWST. So for a long time, of course, we were uh, expecting it to be launched in October of 2018. Uh, no. I'm not sure what it is. Is it like July 2020 or something? I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, anyway, they're still working on it, and we're looking forward to that. Now, uh, there's there's also there's always the question: Well, what's what's kind of the, the future of Hubble? Um, so it's going to basically going to continue until its gyros stop working. Uh, or something else that we don't know about conks out. Um, and uh, they figured out, you know, I think it was designed so that it would need three gyros to operate. Now, uh, with some of the earlier close calls, they, they figured out how to run it with one gyro, although it doesn't limit what you can do. And so, so anyway, eventually they'll get to that. It will probably stay in orbit, I think, until, you know, it's, it, it, it's coming closer to Earth. And if left to its own devices, I think, I think they think it would re-enter the atmosphere about the middle of the 2030s. Now, actually, uh, there, has a law, there has been a law passed that NASA has to do something to either have a controlled re-entry or to boot it into a higher orbit, although... I don't think anything has really seriously been done. There's not a spacecraft sitting in a garage somewhere. Um, they, they would have to uh, start on that, but they just think they have the luxury of time to do that. And uh, uh, 
But yeah, they hope to get a few more years. In fact, uh, at the uh, at the at the party I was at the other night, uh, you know, full of Apple scientists and staff, uh, I heard somebody uh, doing a little cheer like a political rally, but not four more years. They were saying ten more years. I don't know if they'll get that, but we'll see. And uh, so uh, there was talk at one time about bringing. Uh, bringing Hubble back, and an interesting little story, this is, this is a number of years ago, uh, uh, they basically asked the uh, astronauts, they had a meeting at the astronaut office and they said, well, uh, who in here would be happy to put their necks on the line to improve the science or prolong the science on Hubble? Every hand went up. How many would like to put their necks on the line to bring Hubble back to the Smithsonian? No hands went up. <laughs> uh, but the fact of the matter is that a lot of it is already at the Smithsonian. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, this thing here that looks like it was in Al Capone's garage is with, with Pick 2, which took most of the famous photos of Hubble that Hubble took. Uh, and, and all those holes mark a spot where it's hit by uh, a, a small a micrometeoroid. Now they weren't that uh, that uh, the holes weren't that big, but they, they 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 took them out for further study. But but each of those represents a small little uh, impact. That's sort of the, the fender on the outside of it. The thing that the uh, uh, on the left there, that's actually that co-star instrument I told you about that put the mirrors in the path, and you can see the little mirrors there. They're about as, not much bigger than what a dentist would stick in your mouth, but precision, uh, precision engineered. And yeah, you know, just four or five days ago, I, walk, I took these pictures a few years ago, but I walked by them the other day, you know, and they're there. So is the backup mirror for the Hubble, which is ground to the correct shape. And, uh, and, uh, and also they, a test article that they built for Hubble, a full-scale test article. So it gives you, it's, it's practically everything but, uh, but uh, the actual hu uh, Hubble telescope is there. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of work. The, the other thing from Hubble, the, the other big legacy is the... Uh, is the archive. You know, a lot of the, the stuff that's in the archive has never really been looked at by anybody. And in fact, some of the work that's being done now are what they call treasury programs, where they're just, you know, amassing huge amount of, uh, huge amounts of data about certain things, which will give people years, uh, uh, years of work. So, uh, uh, you know, it could be that most important, we'll have to see. But uh, anyway, that's uh, that's that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris, for sharing that your adventures with us. What a great opportunity to meet all these personalities who made such a big contribution to them. Success of the mission down there. That's a real, revered fortune to be able to, to meet these people and tell them stories about them. I'm sure. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Is there any questions for uh, Chris? Are you signing up for an HWSD uh, book? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, my book. Uh, uh, follows on another book called The Space Telescope, which is about how Hubble was, was built by a guy named Robert Smith, who's one of my academic uh, mentors. And uh, when this contract came up, the first thing I did is call up Robert. He said, are you, are you bidding on this? He said, no. So, so I, I bid for this book. But Robert is working on a book on the, on the uh, uh, creation of JWST. Um, so, uh, so, so that's his book. So, uh, and, and I, and I, I, I'm told it's, uh, it's going to be quite a tale, you know, uh, 
I, I got some knowing looks from them, you know, when, when the word came out that they turned it upside down and there were bolts falling out of it and stuff like that. So, uh, anyway, uh, so uh, yeah, I may, I may do something about JWST, but uh, right now that's his department. <laughs> Yes. It's a little hard to get to with the current Well, of course, uh, now that the shuttle is grown, there's there's uh, there's nothing that could do that job. Although, you know, Frank Cephalina, I wouldn't put anything past him. You know, uh, so so Hubble is is about it's about what three hundred and some miles up. And uh, it's just at the upper edge of the of the, the, the shuttle's capability. And uh, so when they started sending missions there, all the astronauts were like this because because they were much higher than or relatively higher than what they were used to. Um, and they had to be very careful with their fuel margins because uh, uh, you know they couldn't spend too much time. Uh, chasing it because otherwise they wouldn't have enough fuel to get home, you know. Uh, so, uh, but you know that's that it, it's not that uh, it's not that difficult, and you know so uh, it's it's in quite it's in a different orbit from the from the space station. It's a higher orbit, and it's also at a different inclination. It's actually closer to the uh, equator. If you I think on 28 degree, you can see the space station up here when it passes over because it, it goes uh, up to 51 degrees. But the only time I've seen Hubble was when I was down in California. So uh, anyway, it's but now there's no spacecraft that's 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 equipped to fix it, and I don't you know I don't think you know I don't think they you know they I think people. Feel that they've got good value out of it. When they launched it, they said, "Oh, we'll get 15 years out of it, and you know, we're within, you know, slightly over a year. We'll be celebrating 30 years." So, so, uh, but yeah, I would be. Uh, well, I will. I will talk about JWST. There will be another time. Yeah. Any other questions, or did you, did you I have a comment. Just questions. Take it first. Go ahead. Well, just that you mentioned the archive that they have. Yeah. For those that haven't tried it, it it's not that difficult to get into it. I, I got into it and had a go at Pillars of Creation doing my own pilots for it. Yeah. And I made four different versions, and it's kind of fun. Yeah. Not, not that hard to do. So if you, if you don't like staying out all night to do your own Photographs, you can still process stuff. <laughs> yeah, a great job. Are you her in the socks? Oh. Yes, yeah. a, a great job. Uh, topic for uh, Astro Cafes. Yes, Chris, uh, you mentioned the, the public relations and communications aspects of, of the NASA and the Space <coughs> Telescope Institute pursued right. during the Hubble lifetime, and, and I just wanted to mention. Uh, about, uh, I guess in about 2004, uh, I was able to meet uh, Story Musgrove and talk with him for about half an hour. Yeah. And my God, he's fantastic to listen to. And he, one of the things that I really vividly remember is he showed me his appointment book, which he kept, he kept on paper at that time. And he had uh, uh, speaking engagements, sometimes multiple times a day, scheduled out almost every day for the following two years, all about his experiences in space, particularly this, the Hubble uh, mission. And his, his discussion of, uh, of that is, is really compelling. But, but the whole thing about Hubble that is kind of under, not underappreciated, but, but understated is the, the massive publicity machine that they really had, that NASA had around Hubble once it became a success. Did you review that in your book at all, or was that considered not part of the operational? No, I, 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 I talk about that because, I, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's an important part of it. I'm not sure, 
you know, I'm not sure I would call it a, a, a massive thing where you have hundreds of people working on it, you know, like, and, and you have the, uh, you know, the Space Telescope Institute, and Science Institute, and NASA, and, you know, sometimes one would be jealous of the others, and, and but also, also, there's all sorts of situations where uh, you have to be careful of not overstepping, you know, like, you know, scientists are people too, and sometimes they oversell things, and, and, uh, and, but also, also the, the, the people in, in PR can do that too, and, yeah, I think there's sort of a, a couple of situations uh, where they, you know, more inadvertently than anything else may have kind of overstep things but yeah there's uh, uh, that is a, an interesting part of it you know and uh, Hubble uh, it, it, you know I, I was talking about stuff being downloaded from the internet and 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 and, and uh, that's a big part of the Hubble story is, is sort of the PR on uh, on the internet because first they had you know this gigantic lab where they were grinding out these these uh, these eight by ten color glossies, and you know, eventually they had to close it down because everything was just being done electronically. You know, and you just have a big printer that would do it when you needed those things, which was not often. So, uh, and there's also something I'm not going to go into great detail, but there is a thing called the Hubble Heritage Program, which was designed to get you know photographs kind of public. <coughs> consumption and that was a group of astronomers that actually kind of ran that as opposed to the, the PR folks so I'll talk about that very good well uh, nor I normally we give uh, a, a gift as a token of appreciation and I'm quite proud because it's a coveted mug or something like that it's highly likely you might have one already. So we're going to give you one so you can have a collection of maybe two or four of these. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, so there is a gathering at the uh, fourth floor of the Elliott Building in the Astronomy Lodge for uh, Astronomy Lounge for uh, Cookies and Tea. And some people would like a calendar, please come and see me or Lori.